Hey everyone, I'm back with another Pro League analysis video for the R6 Canada Nationals. This will be the last analysis video as this is going to be the last week of the R6 Canada Nationals before the finals taking place in Toronto at EGLX. For this week's video, we're looking at plays that took place during week 2 and week 3. And today, Saturday, October 5th, the date of this video airing, is the final week of the second stretch of the R6 Canada Nationals where we're going to decide which teams go to land and compete in Toronto. So if you want to see which teams are going to make it, stop by the Rainbow Six channel and watch live tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But anyways, let's get into analyzing some plays. There's two roamers right now for Livid on the far side. Looks like it's Eventful and Mustache, I think, on the far side, over by Jim and Master. Eventful's just constantly hopping on cams. Or sorry, Mustache is hopping on the cams, so... Mm -hmm. Waiting to see if they even know where the tree cam is. Don's going to rip open the CC window, try and apply some pressure and stop a possible bandit trick. So good establishment of positioning here for momentum. An IQ might be nice here because Mustache could be able to get a free pick if he's got that information being called to him from teammates. He's looking at himself. Nobody's out here at the moment. But again, if somebody chooses to come on over here, as you are mentioning, for momentum, that could be a huge problem. Still trying to open up this CCTV wall, and they should be successful. However, Romulus is trying to put a stop to that, despite the fact that he's got some issues going on with him. They will try to place those down. We haven't actually seen the Thermite get placed on the wall yet, so this is interesting. He's actually used both of them, so no, he's not going to be able to get that opened up. Oh, no. That's sort of the same issue. You're not bringing that double Heartbreak. He's going to come back to bite you, and the Ash going down as well. That's a big problem for momentum. Rosancy and Exod applying some pressure now from the bottom of the blue stairs, and Don's unaware of where he had scampered off to, but it was down towards the generator downstairs, and once again the scramble ensues for momentum as they run out of hard breach potential. So your options are doors and stairs. So they're going to enter in downstairs into stock. Unic and Grixt also pushing downstairs. These names are going to be quite the trip, and Angle's being okay. brought in, but there goes Exod. Nice shot there from Don. Down to about 10 HP at the base of the cache stairs, and I think that was a team kill, so yep. Unik not starting things off hot onto his teammate there, and now it's a full transition to the far side, but Mustache has the main stairs cut off, and he's going to grab two quickly. All down to Wolf, the last remaining member for Momentum, spiraling back and forth, and as he tries to retreat, Mustache will cut him off for three on the rounds. So for the first clip, I wanted to talk about some of the issues some of the attackers had, and also how the defenders played it well. So ban tricking on CCTV wall is a very common strat in ranked and in pro league because it's very easy to hold that wall as long as they don't capital bolt you. Now Momentum knew about this and they brought out a capital ready to counter the bandit tricking. But for some reason they never actually used him. You can see him opening up the window and preparing to get over there, but he never actually goes up to fireball the wall. In the end it would probably was for the best because if he had done it, he would have got jumped out on by Valkyrie and died. And perhaps there was a call here that I don't know about, maybe he saw the windows prepped, maybe he knew that there was a camera out there and that's why he rotates back over to CCTV wall, but then ultimately kind of makes him useless. Because now Thermite wasn't able to break open the wall, but used both his Thermite charges and wasted them, and then now they have to do a full five-man rotate to try to take sight from somewhere else. So this is both a big mistake on the attacker's part, as well as very nicely played by the defenders. Having someone be ready to take out the Capitao as soon as he tries to go for the fireball is an excellent move because it prevents them from easily opening the wall. And once that wall is open, generally the attackers have free reign of sight. But I do think the attackers could have tried to do something a bit more to allow Capitao to fireball the wall. They had a few claymores on their side, they could have easily had someone rotate around and put a claymore at the windows that they thought Valkyrie was going to jump out of, and then he would be safe. If Capitao died, at least Valkyrie would die too. Or, as the casters had said, maybe bring a IQ to counter the Valkyrie pick, because then you're going to be able to get the cameras easily. But overall, this is not how you want to breach in the CCTV. Wasting both your Thermite charges before Capitao even has a chance to shoot a fireball is pretty rough. Take the time. They had like two minutes left. They could have easily coordinated with the team, go around, set up the Claymore, set up everything so that you can make sure you can fireball, and then break open the wall. Don't get impatient and try to break it early and waste your Thermite charges. You only have two of them. Hey, Barstock. Barstock's the best, man. Barstock is awful. Yeah, Listen, like there's there's meta followers and there's meta changers. Yeah? We're just meta changers, right? We're just ahead of the game. Oh, That's sure all thing. it is. Sure thing. I'll see you in uh, last place of CL Flynn. <laughs> Yo, bet. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even cast it. You're just sitting there watching while I keep uh, keep changing the game, bud. It's because I got to be here casting Canada Nationals instead. Imagine That's okay. not being able to bo do both. Hmm. They're approaching the building now. <laughs> 
left-hand side, as we said. Getting in, going onto the Ash, and so a little bit of problems with him dying earlier as well in that last round. Um, I think he was the first one to get killed by that flank, so that's fine. But again, perhaps that's something Momentum can look at. You know, once that Roamer co starts coming down, he needs to make those calls. Then he needs to be able to like turn around and uh, shoot at Mustache when he's pushing you. I think you can expect Livid to Drone keep playing activated. aggressively on this defense because if your Momentum, like you know, you're probably going to come into things. Expect Livid to play a little bit dumb, and if you play like. A little bit more safe than you're used to. I think you can actually catch them off guard doing things that they shouldn't be. I like to swap to a jackal as well if it's in play. Yeah. Why not have it just to try and lock down someone? Like you said, they've been playing pretty individual on the roam as well in terms of their aggression. So start that off for you. Exot's going to take a little bit of damage on the smoke. He's going to lose about 20, and Don's made his way into logistics already. There's a wooden barricade standing in his way between him and the hallway, but Romulus eh, seems mm. well aware of what is happening. Gurks is going to take down Eventful to start things off. So there goes the Jaeger. Taking a lot of damage under your smoke now. Burning out the ADS as well in the midst of a hailstorm of bullets inside the window of the Exot. So there goes Gurks leveling things up to a 4v4. Another one now for Don this time as he pushes through, but the bandit trick will be successful from Romulus once again. The smoke's come pouring down into the hallway, and it's just a massacre in this main hallway as the push for momentum on the far side of the map is paying dividends for them. Ancity pushing into the objective now has master control. Still worrying about a bandit trick will be Romulus, and he'll be successful two for two once again, but he'll be cut down in the process, putting down that car battery. So Mustache now has to retake in a 1v4. Two attackers for momentum still stuck out outside, and he has to regain control of the main stairs, waiting for rotations towards the gym window, which is exactly where everyone from Momentum is going. Oh, this is tough. Ron, or Mustache had an option there, but he didn't quite hit the shot that he had to. He's kind of going to run down the stairs. That plant will get set down, and he's looking. He's basically only got one way to come up, and he is being a lot, very noisy with this barbed wire underneath him. He's got a lot of pings, but the players on Momentum are playing it smart. They're just backing off. They know that they don't have to push. Mustache makes his way into the bomb site. They don't really know that he's here, but they'll peek around the wall and they will be able to find him eventually. So the second clip takes place right after the first one, and they kind of go hand in hand. It shows how the attackers adapted and played differently to make sure that they could counter the bandit tricking. Now the defenders did a full setup where basically bandit is immune. They're bandit tricking the gym bedroom wall, they have deployable shield, castle barricade, ADSs, everything set up to make sure that he is safe behind the wall. And with Maverick Band, there's no way that they can break it other than a Thermite or Hibana. So they have the perfect setup going. And the attackers know this. So for the entire round, Thermite and Thatcher make it their goal to try to keep Bandit occupied on the wall. That is one less defender roaming around or paying attention to what's happening. Then they have Zofia go towards the gym window, ready to try to break down the barricade and shield to prevent Bandit from bandit tricking. So Smoke plays a little aggressively and actually manages to take out Zofia before she's able to stop Bandit from bandit tricking. This ultimately actually worked out in their favor because in the end it meant that Bandit was super dedicated to that wall and holding it. Meanwhile we have Ash and Jackal pushing from the other sides of the map. Ash from CCTV and Jackal through logistics. Jackal plays this incredibly well, in my opinion, because he smokes out the hallway and then is peeking into Master Bedroom. This way, no one can see him from the hallway itself, from 90, like where Bandit is, or from the staircase. It's just completely smoked off. Meanwhile, he has a clear line of sight into Master Bedroom. And as you can see, when he does this, it causes a lot of mayhem for the defenders as they know that they have to watch it, but they also have to watch for the wall. Bandit's really occupied trying to banter the wall and look towards Jackal. Meanwhile, Smoke's throwing down his gas canisters early to try to prevent Jackal from just walking in and killing Bandit. It's a lot of dedicated utility just to hold Jackal back. Meanwhile, Ash is now pushing in through CCTV and in through construction and just tearing people apart one by one. It quickly becomes a 4v2 where the last two are Bandit and Castle who's roaming downstairs. This entire time, Bandit's being tracked by Jackal, so is unable to do anything. He's stuck in the corner there, he knows he has to ban trick, and he's being pinged non-stop. Ash pushes in all the way through Jim because of the rotate hole, and then just takes out Bandit. Bandit stayed there for the entire round for like two minutes, trying to ban trick the wall, and successfully did. He held it off, but at the cost of his life, and ultimately that is worth it for the attackers. Now, they have complete sight control, Cass is in a 1v4, and he has to either go through the main staircase, which is a death sentence, or he has to go around to CCTV, which is also a death sentence. And then ultimately, the attackers win out the round. So like I said, great adaptation from the attacker's side. They actually put someone dedicated to try to stop the band tricking this time, as opposed to where they had Capitao just fall off. And they kept him occupied long enough where the attackers could push in from the other side and slowly pick off defenders. 
Whereas last time, I think they lost both their thermite charges within 45 seconds or one minute. This time they made it last a whole two minutes before they lost their thermite charges. And while they lost the charges and weren't able to open up the wall, ultimately they won because they were able to collapse onto site after the fact. So good job for the attackers for adapting so well. Uh, ops with shields. Yeah, smoke has a deployable now. Um, Echo has a deployable. Um, there aren't many anymore. No, it's tough. Well, they got buffed, so you got to take them away from a lot of operators and you yeah. know, give them to other operators. I think Legion... Does Legion still have one or does he have a bulletproof now? I think Legion has a bulletproof now. Yeah, I don't think he has one. Yeah. Man, that's tough. Look at this, though. Sin prepping a C4. If this door gets opened up, the person oh, on the other side does. better be careful. True, we've seen that already today. That was a bit of a disaster. Mm -hmm. Sin opting not to bring it. We'll see if he regrets that decision because if he dies to this, he's probably... Not going to be happy that he brought the Nitro Cell. He's going to throw it on out, but not far enough to get the full damage on a max. About half his HP gone, though. So I think you're happy with that. You don't know that you got it, but I still think that that's probably worth. Nitro Cell for half HP isn't ideal. You could be getting a kill with that, but it's better than just wasting it, which oftentimes people would. Yeah, he's waiting for the Repel in, but it never quite came, just because Max was playing a little safe there, and the pings were trailing Cinnamon as he tried to escape back in towards Aviator, and here come the shots. More pings ringing out onto him now inside of the vault being collapsed upon from multiple angles. Getting off the drone as Max pushes in close range, proning him behind the desk in a vault to try and do any damage possible. But it'll be the man that he came first blows with in Max on the buck to take him down. So good start here for the old man club on the clear. They've lost a little bit of health on both Max and Don Papo, but it's a, it's a good start nonetheless getting the kill onto the Valkyrie and eating that C4 early. So now they can push from the far side across. Max hungry for these kills, almost got a second one as well over on the staircase, but didn't quite hit the shot that he had to. So first getting the revenge on a Cinnamon, and now things will slow down a little bit. And that's nice roam clear, getting uh, Cinnamon off of the board. After he did a little bit of damage to your buck, still two frag grenades, still a lot of utility to be able to use by Max. If he wants to go downstairs, he's got that option available to him. Sky's jumping in this window, could find himself in a bit of trouble. Thinking better of it for now, worry about a bit of a run out. Again, if you've got somebody roaming down there like you do, then that could be dangerous. Jolly's still able to run anywhere on the map that he wants to go. Playing on the dock can definitely get aggressive on that operator, but hasn't done it yet. We see Dawn still dealing with some op with uh, some utility, and yeah, here's Jolly down on this first floor. Not really in a position to go for an immediate uh, battle, but if he walks up those staircases, could look around, could eventually try to find somebody. I believe he was the one who initially got in that engagement with Max right after Sin had died, so... Time's ticking down here for OMC. They really got to start getting into things. Jolly just sitting around waiting for a move to be made. It's going to be Max who ends up finding the second kill of the round. So he's got all of them finding the Owly. And that's going to be the Maestro off the board as well. So there goes some more people into the bomb site. Tev going for the plants. He's now in the bomb, but he can't quite go for that plant yet. Now he will. Had to pull that needle out of his foot first. Dawn gets a kill to try to make things even more in favor of OMC. If they get this plant, it's gonna be a disaster for Yes. Snug gets the first one, Teb gets another one for the team of Yes. It's a team kill, a bit of a missed throw from Snug means that they're not gonna be able to use that all too effectively. There's pings coming inside of the master bedroom and inside of the bathroom, but nobody's in there though. So close to be able to fuse that, but he can't quite hit it yet. miso has gotta get these kills before he can go for it. Peeking into the master bedroom, just pre-firing the whole angle, and he will be rewarded with a kill on a Teb because he was so low HP. Only two attackers still try to stop this, but they need to get him fast. Snug with a pistol, be able to take down one, two. Big plays coming out from Snug, and yes, get round seven. Probably shouldn't have won that one, but they do it. This round, I really want to highlight how everything can go so well for your team and then start to spiral out of control real quick, even though you have the advantage. But before we get into all of that, first, I want to highlight the pretty risky and honestly, I'd say not worthwhile play by Valkyrie. Valkyrie has the only C4 in the entire defending team and they have intel in Master Bedroom. They really should have tried to save that C4 to either deny plant or deny breaching. Playing downstairs would have been the easiest option, C4 below when Thermite tries to go for the wall and get a kill as well as deny all breaching potential. But instead they go over to study room and try to C4 outside the balcony. If she had ultimately gotten a kill, maybe it would have been worth it. Really, she only got 50 HP off of Buck, but even then I think it was a bit questionable. Even if you'd killed Buck here, it would have been much more worthwhile to save it for anti-plant or anti-breach. But then the attackers play it pretty well here. They know Valkyrie's over here. Valkyrie makes a mistake of going into Vault, one of the hardest places to get out of when you're surrounded, just because there's only two doorways and no cover. 
So the attackers coordinate super well here. IQ decides to go through study. Buck is holding down the hallway, making sure she doesn't leave another way. And then they just have the drone come in from, I'm assuming, probably Dokubi or something. And they're just spamming her with pings. Meanwhile, the attackers are slowly trying to push in at the same time. And Buck gets a little antsy and actually pushes in and kills Valkyrie. And honestly, Valkyrie played that as good as she could in that situation. Just because, I don't know if you guys have ever been in that situation. It is very stressful when you have two attackers pincering you, as well as a drone spotting you non-stop. But while I did play that out super well, the rest of the round starts to not so much go in their favor. A lot of very small mistakes that ultimately ended up costing the entire round. It took the attackers about another minute and a half just to breach the wall and then get into sight, which is pretty bad in terms of time management. They got one kill early and then stagnated very hard. But luckily as they start to push in, second logic bomb goes out, Buck manages to take out Maestro, and they cover for the plant. I personally would have pushed in a little bit sooner. Thermite pushed in after Logic Bomb had already finished and really should have tried to go in probably after a second of it being deployed. But now it turns into a 5v2. Plant's going down, and here's where the attackers really started to drop the ball hard. As you can see, all the attackers inside Master Bedroom are getting pinged non-stop. This is where IQ would have been absolutely fundamental. Or even Thatcher. Thatcher's used all his EMP somehow, and they didn't even have any anti-wall breach. So he must have used, I'm assuming, two on Maestro cameras and then wasted the last one for lesion mines or something. But either Thatcher or IQ could have taken out the camera spawning them non-stop. But instead they leave it up and it absolutely destroys them because now the defenders know where everyone is. But before those pings happen, we do see a team kill from Thermite onto Buck. My best guess of what happened here is Thermite stuck the plant and then as soon as the plant goes down, he looks up, ready for the defenders to peek him. And he just assumed that if someone was in deer, it was a defender. So he shoots Buck and manages to get a team kill. And like I said, they all retreat into Master Bedroom, getting spotted non-stop. The defenders know exactly where they are. Jaeger goes for the wide swing and infinite pre-fire takes out Thermite. And then this is where the attackers start to falter a lot more. They both were in positions where they couldn't easily cover the diffuser. They were too far away, and if they tried to push in through Master Bedroom, the defenders would know when they're pushing. Thatcher's all the way in Closet, and Dogaby's in Master Bathroom. Jaeger starts to try to stick the diffuse, and both the attackers either have to run for about 3 seconds to actually get there, or just wait to see if it's a fake. Dogaby decides to rush for it, but Legion can hear her because when you're sprinting, you can easily be heard. Legion gets ready for the push and manages to take out Dokubi with the pistol and then they have the camera in Master Bedroom so they know when Thatcher's pushing and Legion just flicks over and kills Thatcher as well. Jaeger stuck the defuse and manages to get it off before the time runs out. So if that intel had been eliminated it would have been a lot harder going for the defenders. They would not have been able to cover Jaeger so perfectly when he went to try to defuse the bomb. All they needed was just either a Thatcher EMP in Master Bedroom or an IQ. That's it. Now, keep in mind, they were running low on time, like when they got the diffuser down, there was only a few seconds left in the round. IQ didn't really have too much time to rotate over, but I also think she could have made the time. The diffuser had just gone down, you got about 45 seconds, you have time to run around. But instead, they all started to push in, and the 5v2 being aggressive because they assumed that they had the advantage, and then very quickly their numbers started to dwindle. So like I said, a lot of little mistakes that added up to them losing the round. All of Yes right now are kind of all over the place and, and having great impact on the round. Cinnamon debating going for a run out outside of detention. There's a man waiting for him. It'll be Max. The wall gets opened up, and as he swings in, Cinnamon on the quick peek. Just getting a little too cute with it. So the only damage done will actually be Cinnamon taking a little bit of damage himself with his own impact grenade. <laughs> it was a good try. Uh, give him that, but no, unfortunately he doesn't able to do anything. Hello, Snug just runs into the break room and he gets a kill. Dawn is apparently not paying attention and he's gonna get caught off guard. Very aggressive stuff, we were just talking about how Snug's been playing great so far. Doesn't take a bit of damage in that engagement. Jolly has somehow taken a little bit though, and so he's gonna be hurting unless he can, well, unless nothing. There's no docks on his team. There we go, Max getting a kill, but eventually also shut down in break room, so this is a little bit tough. LWS walks on in and takes down Snug too. Max, excuse me, did not go down, but still that puts them into a player advantage on Old Man Club. So despite going down on every single bomb site and losing them, they have seemingly done pretty well here in round number four, attacking again onto Armor. They just now need to clear up a couple more kills, and this will go their favor. They've got control of most of this sort of south side of the map. They've got that break room. They've got a lot of this hallway control as well. 
worried about this wall, and this is where the push is often going to come in for this bomb site. You've got Owly trying to hold it down and hits a quick shot on LWS, ready to throw that EMP grenade, get some utility, but you lost your life for it. Not going to be worth it all. Owly starts to burn, and he needs to get back to his teammates, but he can't do it. He's caught in the crossfire. Uh, Max take down Alleys, tries to retreat, but there goes Mizio inside of CC in the peak. I think that was a team kill. No, there goes Cinnamon, so they both go for the flank. There goes Cinnamon, so now Mizio has to retake back onto the site as it's Tev and Skies alive. The plant going down now by Tev over by the armory wall, and Skies was recently pinged inside of Archives, but he'll make his way over in towards the half wall now, try and protect Tev as it's 2v1, and Mizio amidst the flashbangs will be pushing on through. Both members still holding from inside the building, and I believe that was Skies to shut it down. No, it was Tev on the Thermite. For this next clip, we're mainly going to highlight a few key points that really showcase miscommunication as well as unawareness. Not necessarily on anyone's fault, but just because of how many things are going on, it can be very hard to keep track of what's happening. The first misplay we're going to talk about, which wasn't necessarily a misplay by team communication, but more so just a generic misplay, was when... It's a 4v3 situation for the attackers, and Maestro gets flame bolted out of the half wall. Capitel uses a fire bolt, gets Maestro out of there. Maestro is sitting by next to the small office slash bomb area, waiting for the fire to deplete, and then for some reason pushes back towards half wall. He does manage to get a kill while doing so, but he knows that Capitao has another firebolt, which means that he's going to get pushed out of that corner yet again. Getting that one kill, I guess, technically put it more towards their advantage, because instead of a 4v3, it's a 3v3, but then he sacrifices his own life and it goes back down to a 3v2. Not really worth it. Especially when he could have just held next to bomb or through office wall and just sprayed through and killed them just the same. And maybe if he just needed some more help, he should have just got his teammates to try to push in a little bit quicker. He was a little impatient and pushed in for the kill slash holding half wall when his teammates weren't fully there yet. But then this next part that takes place right after is where the big, big display of miscommunication comes from. Jaeger and Legion are both pushing towards CCTV to flank the Zofia and Thermite, as well as the Capitao. They're both pushed in and Legion does not realize where his teammate is. As they push in, Legion hears Jaeger takes his shots towards Capitao and then flicks onto Jaeger and deals about 50 damage to him through the monitor. This obviously hurts Jaeger and gets himself killed because the enemies hear him and flick onto him. So Legion was just in a state of complete confusion because he had no idea that his teammate was right there or, if I had to guess, probably thought that maybe there just turned out to be someone lying down there and they killed Jaeger and then he had to flick onto them. I don't know what he thought, but he really should have known where his teammate was and to not worry about the banana desk. Jaeger manages to get it with his life, but then it's a 2v1 and Thermite and Zofia plant. Now Jaeger runs all the way back, and this is where another part of miscommunication comes in. One of the attackers gets spotted inside of archives and then rotates out towards half wall. Now the ping is still there for Jaeger, and Jaeger for some reason thinks that there's still in archives or jumped out the window. I'm not sure exactly what happened, maybe Zofia or Thermite destroyed the camera that was spotting them in archives and then rotated out so the defenders didn't have any more new intel, but it really doesn't seem like it. It seems like they got spotted, ran out, and then the defenders didn't update the intel. They didn't let Jaeger know that there was no one in archives or on the balcony, because Jaeger pushes in, looks towards the ping, and then looks out to the window, assuming that the person who got pinged had jumped out that window. This leaves Thermite to just see him running up towards the hole in the wall and then just shoots him in the back. Had Jaeger known that they were both inside armory, he could have played that a little differently, and possibly won if he played it right. He would have been able to see Zofia by half wall, and then would have had to swing out onto Thermite and kill him. But it would have been a lot better than walking towards a window where no one was and getting shot in the back. So there definitely should have been some more communication there, but the key part of it all was just Legion shooting onto Jaeger. If Legion hadn't done that, they might have been able to kill more than just Capitao, and it would have been a 2v1 situation for them. And so there was team damage which led to Legion dying since he wasn't looking at the enemies anymore. And this is why constant communication is critical. So two unsuccessful bombsite defenses upstairs inside of CCTV and Cash. Yeah, that's going to push us back downstairs to Church and Arsenal where Psychopath's time control was nothing like it was the last couple rounds, which was uh, swift to say the least. Mm -hmm. Last time Psychopaths attacked this bomb site, they tried to plant with 15 seconds left and a 5e5. I don't think I need to explain what happened for the rest of the round because it's kind of obvious. 
didn't go well. Uh, back downstairs here for uh, for Supernova, trying to, I guess, regain control of the game, regain control of the momentum that's in this uh, in this series. Crusher's gone off the AUG and gone back to the TCSG, also with a holographic. Giving up the ACOG advantage, I guess, recoil control more favorable than uh, range of engagement. We'll see what happens with this blue hold, because blue has been a pinnacle portion of all the defenses so far downstairs between both teams, and yet no one's actually opted to sit inside of blue behind the generator and actually hard hold it. Everyone's been very timid in terms of holding inside a generator unless it's a Ryan on a smoke going for a peek in an oil pit. Everyone else so far has been just incredibly petrified of, of playing in behind the generator and, and actually trying to take a gunfight towards the top of the blue stairs or even just provide some kind of resistance. Everyone's been playing from inside a church beyond a reinforcement and a rotate. Just playing it very lackadaisically. And I think as long as you can hard hold inside a blue for a little bit longer here for Supernova, you can put this to match point right now and, and at least put yourself in a position to uh, get inches closer to coastline. Yeah, this was a bomb thing they were pretty good at last time around. They don't play it super aggressively. Here come the impact tricks, and it looks like two of those X-Kairos will go off. That's not going to be enough to open up that hatch. Bozak's going to have to use a second set, and hopefully this one will be a little bit more effective. There goes the second impact. And it looks like it did get a couple of them. Will it be enough, though? Yeah, no, that hatch is not getting opened up unless Bozak wants to use his last X-Kairos on it. He thinks it's worth it, so he will utilize those last set, but that's three set of x -Kairos. So We saw time and time again, Cycle Pass really only, or Supernova, excuse me, really only had to use one every single time. So that's a lot of utility wasted for uh, PKP. Supernova going to be quite happy with all the impact tricking that they were successfully uh, able to utilize there. A couple of these other hatches were opened up, of course, by their hard, other hard destructor, Socrates. But that means he's probably only going to have one of those exothermic charges once they get on downstairs. It means that Durst's going to be locked up for the entire round. Um, it means that he's only going to have really one attempt to try to open up that church wall if that's where he wants to go with it. A couple of frag grenades being tossed down as well, but still five on five. The attackers are lurking down in towards the basement. Ryan's going to bail out of oil pit, and it's probably a good idea with the number of uh, number of guns that were trained upon him trying to push down through the oil pit tunnel. It's a bit of a death sentence. Now Bozak going to be pushing through dirt. The flashbang is going to start disorienting Wacky as he's full blind trying to retreat into the bomb site. There's the pick up of the smoke, and Bozak nearly hitting the head of the second one onto Nivak. The pre-fire never ending, but going prone. It's an onslaught now from the Psychopaths as they try to make it three in a row on the attack. The plant going down from Storms inside Arsenal. That Nitro set will fall well short. Shot in the back on the retreat now will be the Bandit retreating through Church. And last alive inside, it's Bozak on a 4K. Psychopaths are going to tie things up 5-5. Five, five. For the second last clip, we're going to talk about something that I just made up on the spot, and it's called Utility Trading. Trademark. So what utility trading is, is, well, as it sounds, trading off utility. Using one gadget to waste another gadget on the enemy team, and then back and forth, back and forth. One common example of this is wasting flashbangs on an ADS to burn the ADS so that you can throw in frag grenades. While you may lose some utility just to destroy the enemy's utility, ultimately it usually works out in your favor. And that's actually what happened here. I struggled for a while to think about whether this was worth it or not, because it seemed like a pretty big waste, but ultimately, when you see the plan that the attackers had in mind, it worked out perfectly. So Hibana is pushing for the kitchen hatch. The reason why you don't want Thermite to push for this hatch is because if Thermite tries to break it, you can easily just see for him from below since his legs will usually be exposed. As well, because of impact tricking, it is very easy to destroy a Thermite charge and then that's a huge waste of utility. And for those of you who don't know, impact tricking is basically where you just use impact grenades to destroy hard breaching gadgets. And usually you do it in a situation where you yourself as a defender are perfectly safe and the attacker just gets screwed over. For example, here where Maestro is throwing the impacts at the kitchen floor where he can't be seen, but he can still destroy the Hibana pellets. That's impact tricking. But going back to the utility trading. Basically, as far as my understanding is, there was a Cade originally on that hatch. And then Thatcher comes over, throws his EMP down, and destroys it. That's an even trade of utility, one for one. You lose one EMP, but you get one Electric Claw down. And then Hibana tries to go for the hatch and gets one row of Hibana pellets impact tricked. Trading an impact for a row of Hibana X Kairos is definitely not worth it, but there wasn't much she could do here. Still going one for one. And it uses another row of Hibana pellets and gets impact tricked again. 
Now here I would have said it's definitely worth it because if I'm not mistaken, the first time she threw down pellets, two of them managed to go off. And then the second time she put down pellets, one managed to go off. If she had gone one more pellet off, it would have broken the hatch and that would have been well worth wasting two impacts and an electric claw. But then only three of them managed to go off total so she had to use another row just to break the hatch. Now if they had no thermite, I would have said this is the biggest waste in the world and not at all worth it. But since they had the thermite, thermite was able to open up both dirt and moto drop hatch. So Hibana was able to dedicate all of her utility over to that kitchen hatch. And the reason why ultimately it was also worth it is because they went for a full armory take. By opening up that hatch, you're not able to hide anywhere on the armory side by the gun racks. You have to either push towards blue or you have to be in blue or church, which makes it very limiting to hold as a defender. So the attackers made the decision that it was well worth wasting all of their Hibana pellets just to make sure that the defenders can't hide underneath the hatch. And ultimately it worked out because then all the attackers, once they got the hatch open, migrated over to either holding the hatch or going through dirt tunnel. And since no one can hide underneath the hatch since it's open, that means they can just kind of walk right in through dirt, take out anyone sitting next to the boxes or by blue door, and then just they own sight right there. So like I said, ultimately worth it, and I think they played it out as well as they could. And holy, what are these operators? <laughs> I was staring at this the whole time. So Sin locks in Capcan immediately. Jolly then goes and locks in the Frost, and then Six picks away from the Frost to the Kavira. I'm sure that I've never seen that before in my life. And they're like going 100%. downstairs. This is our first view of Kitchen and Dining. Well, they have to. The up two stairs are locked off, so that makes sense. But wow. These are the operators you're going to try to win the series with. Okay. I'm okay with this. I don't know that I am for yes, but I'm, I'm okay excited. I'm excited. I, I think the big thing is that tempo has been a big problem for the old man club. Sure. On every attacking round, they've been pushing in. Whether they've been successful or unsuccessful in the round, they've been pushing in with about 30 seconds left. Trap operators. Ten seconds to go. Okay. They're just, they're just so incredibly powerful when teams aren't Five paying attention and when they take too long on a push. It'll be attackers curious to see where Cinnamon elects to drop all these. Looks like he was avoiding some drones there for a while as well. And, of course, we have a Cav. So, Kevin, show us a lot of Jolly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kevin, our wonderful observer here at the Canada Nationals. Yeah, the Cav. It's interesting with the six picks, too, that they chose to show both a Frost and a Cap Can. That means that Old Man Club are going to know that one of those two operators are on the board. So they're going to be looking for traps no matter what. They know there's going to be traps. They don't necessarily know what kind of traps until they see the Cap Can with a drone. Um, but they're not going to be necessarily expecting the Kavira. And showing two trap operators might lead Old Man Club to ignore the basement because while they're bringing traps, why would they also put somebody in the basement? Yet it's happening. You can't forget Legion with some traps of his own as well. Maybe not quite as deadly, but still very annoying and very hard to deal with for Old Man Club. So this is a tough one. OMC have been very slow to get into the building, and I don't think those traps being on the border are a coincidence with that. Well... That guy is going to try and full send into the pantry window. He's going to get slapped away by Owly, and here it comes. No, nope. Jolly's just going to collect a kill onto Tev. There goes the Thermite, though. LWS pushing down to try and reclaim the kill, and he will onto Jolly, so no interrogation. Don Pop attacking on, taking down Owly as they all try to barrel into the site, but Sin will cut him down with the 9 by 19 And another trade here from Max up above in towards the China cabinets. Down to a 2v1 now as the quick kill onto the Jaeger of Misio. So it's all snuggling to keep us in regulation and to send it home here for yes, or it's Max and LWS to clutch up and send us to overtime. They don't know where Snuggling is, playing at the base of the red stairs, waiting for anyone to turn the corner into the hallway. Ping's coming out onto Max inside of the China door as they both amass to try and get a plant attempt going down. Default camera is shot, so lack of intel now. As Max is alone in the site, LWS trying to regroup with him, but low on time and hitting a cap can. And there goes LWS now down to the cap can trap. It's all Snuggling, and he has the health advantage. The impact grenade will be another distraction. Lots of sound, but seeing him in behind the island, Max will clutch it up. So for this last clip, I want to highlight how Six Pick actually managed to impact the whole round. The defenders opted to go for a full trap setup with Capcan, Legion, and Frost. But then they swapped off Frost for Cav. Now Cav is a pick that you almost never want to let them see because then they know what to expect. They know Cav will be there and they know to hunt her down. Whereas if you Six Pick off of her, they have no idea that she's there. They're just going to assume that you're going to go full traps and then she can roam freely without them knowing. As long as you don't get spotted during the prep phase, you're golden. 
And with Frost being shown in the sixth pick, every single time they're going to jump in through a window or go through a doorway, they're going to be afraid of there being a Frost mat. So they're going to drone out everything super extensively and waste time. Overall, a really good next level mind play. And as you can see during the prep phase, Cav is hiding inside the pantry the entire time. She does not want to be seen by drones. She knows no drones are going to come from the staircase because who the hell would drone out from basement. So it allows her to be completely undetected and try to take advantage of the fact the attackers aren't ready for her. And it does work out. As we move forward into the round, Gridlock died, which made it a 4v5, but then Thermite and Sledge both go in through Pantry Stairs. Cav is waiting for them at the bottom, since they're not expecting Cav or someone to be roaming in basement, they don't drone it out. Cav comes upstairs, downs Thermite, kills him, and tries to go for a second, but actually gets picked off by Sledge, still manages to do 50 damage to him. But overall, swapping off from Frost to Cav gave them basically a 1.5 for 1 trade, which is pretty good in my books. But as we move forward into the round, a whole flurry of kills come out and it becomes a 2v1 situation, which is where I think the attackers could have probably played this decently better. Now the situation for them as far as they know is they have no idea where Legion is. He could be on site, he could be holding from above, he could be coming from below, they don't know. And I think this makes Sledge panic. He decides to just jump outside the window and rotate all the way around the map and try to meet Buck in Kitchen, even though he was already in Pantry side, which honestly I think was for the most part a mistake. Yes, I understand that that side seemed clear because Buck kind of went through there, but it also is just as risky as pushing straight in from Pantry. He had to break a barricade just to get in there, which means that if the defender's nearby, they're going to know exactly where Sledge is pushing through. And it didn't help that he managed to run through the one doorway that they hadn't checked and he went through a camp can trap getting downed leaving it into a 1v1 situation for Buck to clutch out with no diffuser on site. In my opinion, what they should have done was just have Sledge push in through Pantry and maybe try to plant in the corner of Kitchen. The risky part would be, obviously, if that lesion is inside of Living Room, or whatever that room's called, he could maybe get an angle onto Sledge and kill him, and then Buck would have to try to trade out. A little risky, but in my opinion, not as risky as running around the entire map just to try to push in where Buck was a few seconds prior. Ultimately, Buck managed to clutch it out, and they win the round, but at a pretty big risk.